Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lois Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program. Today I'd like to talk about Mars and the evolution of thought. There's Mars. Um, it's a little red dot. A lot of us, uh, especially if you grew up in a big city as I did, uh, hi, uh, don't get to see it very much, but if you go out in the country, uh, you certainly can. It's, it's visible. It's actually kind of red. The ancient Egyptians called it hard dekar. It very cleverly translates into the inspired, the red one. That was about all they could do with it. And the question I think before us today, I, I hope, is what do we mean by the evolution of thought? We don't just mean learning something. And how does Mars bear on that? And I think actually that the first question is maybe the harder one to deal with. So I'd like to start with that. And then once we have that a bit under our belts, go back to Mars. Uh, Mars is a planet. Uh, you can see I've underlined the Greek origin of it, Astaris planetes. Um, Astaris is in parenthesis because the Astaris got dropped. That means wandering stars. So the idea of a planet is that it wanders. So the ancient Egyptians, who were not all that good at astronomy, not nearly as uh, adept as the Babylonians, who were superb, uh, they looked up there. They saw the fixed stars. They were in the same relative position night after night. Everything worked just fine. But then there were these other things that sort of wandered around, and they couldn't figure out why they were doing what they were doing. Hence, they called them wanderers. So from the standpoint of their imagination, these bodies, of which they could see five, um, these bodies weren't following fixed rules. So the possibility of impulse, chaos, um, the unexpected, was writ in the sky. And that's not how we think of it. Let's go back to how we think. Uh, I'd like to talk about the savage mind. I'm calling it savage in its etymological sense, meaning wild, untamed, undomesticated. I picked this up from Jack Goody's uh, famous book, The Domestication of the Savage Mind. He talks about how the savage mind first just looks out at nature and it sees stuff. You know, there's stuff out there. Of course, the human eye knows to uh, take that stuff and put it into groups. So, ah, oh, we see trees and lions and uh, clip art. But, uh, <laughs> but we remember that the Aztecs saw the conquistadores arrive on their horses and didn't know that that was a two-part ensemble. You know, it was, oh, they come apart. How interesting. Um, because they had a preconception of a creature that looked like that. So our imagination makes us see things in certain ways. Now, you look out at nature, you see stuff. When I was a kid, I saw about five varieties of trees. After someone taught me to actually identify trees, the number of tree varieties in the world shot up. Now I can drive down 23 and see the shagbark hickory go by. When I was a kid in New York, that was just tree, right? You begin to see things differently. We put them into types, and the savage mind still, still does that. And then sometimes we begin to count them. And that's an interesting move, right? We, we, we sort of say, OK, I have treeness, and I've got three of them. I've got lioness, and I've got two of them. I've got duckitude, and I've got four of those. <laughs> and then something interesting happens, according to Goody. It happens with the Phoenicians. It happens as a consequence of the development of shipping in the Mediterranean. People need to keep track of what's on their ships. So they need to sort of take a clay tablet and draw tree, lion. Well, they don't send lions around, but they do send amphorae of oil. They do send uh, wheat. They do send casks. And the question is, how many? So they start putting down amphora, wheat, oil, cask. They know that's what they're going to ship, and they build that first. 
then they put the marks. The key thing that's going on here is this. That's, that's what Goody says is the domestication of the savage mind. Before shipping, people made marks to record what they saw. After this, people saw what there might be and only recorded the marks of what was, but also the implication of what wasn't. In other words, the universe that the shipper was looking at was a universe of the possible things that could be there, not just the things that were there. That idea is generalizable as a grid. Think of this as a, an Excel spreadsheet. You can write anything you want down the left, anything you want across the right, and the intersection of those cells gives us information. In fact, that is exactly what Mendeleev did in coming up with the uh, periodic table of the elements. On the left, you can see, I hope you can, it's visible here, yes. On the left, you can see his actual handwritten notes. And on the right, you can see two versions of the table that he constructed from these in his first publication about this in 1871. As any of us who studied science know, the crucial thing that Mendeleev did is not simply recognize that these things come in an order, he was able to see where the blanks were. And people could say, ah, we should expect that there might be such and such a thing. The possibility of prediction is based upon seeing the world as following rules, some exemplars of which may be absent. This is the domesticated mind, at least according to Goody. This is, in fact, just a flat database. That's what Mendeleev gives us. The data are of different types, like molecular weight and so on. And then something interesting happened. The world stayed the same from the Phoenicians right down to the mid-1960s, when a graduate student at the University of Michigan named Edgar F. Codd, known as Ted, did something really quite astonishing. And personally, I think that people have not paid enough attention to how astonishing it was. Computers were coming along then, and companies, those of us of a certain age will remember this, were beginning to rely on them a lot for things like billing. You know, the power company had lots of customers, and they wanted to turn out bills, and you got your bill on IBM cards. And the IBM cards had little holes in them, and they had the instruction, do not bend, fold, spindle, or mutilate. Um, it made life a lot easier for the company. Well, what was going on in those days was the flat database. So having the computer, what the company would do would be to have a record, my name, my address, my last bill, my usage of kilowatt hours, my pay rate, I mean my charge rate, and so on, all along the line. Let's say that they changed the residential rate. Every single customer who was a residential customer had to have that number changed in their record. Flat databases offer an enormous opportunity for transcription errors. What's more important, however, at least this is what drove Codd when he was getting his PhD here, the computing speed couldn't handle all that data. And he came up with an idea. It's an idea that we all live with so transparently now that it's hard to believe that it began while I was still in college. It's what we call a relational database. Fundamentally, what he said is, if you're going to have to write the same thing many times, don't bother doing that. Write it once and relate it to all the places where you need that information. So what you see here on the right is simply a diagram of the relationships in a particular database um, that is visualized using Microsoft Access, which is a relational database. And you can see that we have a supplier ID on the upper left. Now, there's going to be a supplier table that says suppliers, and we have the company name, the contact name. These are all the suppliers that might produce stuff this company needs. Now, there's a product ID, right? Every product has to be tracked as well in a flat table. But you don't want to keep writing the supplier information. Let's say you decide to change suppliers for that particular product. Well, you just link that through the supplier ID and presto, when you've changed any information about the supplier, it's related to anything you want to know about the product, and so on and so forth. This may not seem like 
a big deal, but in fact it is a spectacularly big deal. It means we have a different relationship to information than we ever had. By the way, historically, he, uh, he did this. He published a little bit on it. Um, nobody was really interested, but IBM hired him. He uh, went to work for IBM at their Almaden research uh, facility. And in 1969, he published an internal memo about doing this kind of thing. But IBM wasn't really interested in doing much with it. So since he couldn't get them to do much, IBM just wanted to increase the power of their machines. That was how people were going to deal with this excess of data. Um, so he published it as a paper in 1970. And some guy named um, hmm, uh, Larry Ellison thought, oh, that sounds like a good idea. And he's now like the fourth richest man in America because he founded Oracle with this idea that Ted Codd came up with. Well, so much. He didn't give money to U of M, though. I don't know. Anyway, <clears throat> this changes the way we think. Right? For example, if you happen to be going to barnesandnoble.com and happen to look up a book called you know, Mars, A Tour of the Human Imagination, <laughs> you know, uh, it will immediately tell you the people who bought this book also bought Right? A bunch of other things. We expect that now. We expect that. Anybody in this room who's over 30 years of age will be able to remember, it may take an active imagination, we never used to expect that. I mean, one of the reasons we liked our local store is that our local clerk knew our tastes. And we could go in and that person, oh, I'm so glad you're here. You like so and so. We just got thus and such. We don't need that anymore. We've got software that changes the way we think. We expect this. So just last week in Time Magazine, there was an article about what the uh, political parties are doing in order to gear up for the midterm elections. For more risk-averse candidates, the two parties are creating elaborate lists of voting age adults and cross-referencing them with consumer and demographic information, all with an eye towards sending out the most tailored communications possible. No one under 35 wants to hear the same message about Social Security as someone over 35, says ad maker Laura Crawford, and there's no reason why they have to. On one issue, you can make four or five ads targeting entirely different groups, et cetera, et cetera. I can turn it around in 24 hours. The Democratic National Committee plans to use its list to make a series of inductive leaps. If you know what magazines a 40-year-old female voter subscribes to or what websites she reads, says the consultant, you can apply that to things like Google AdSense, which generates increasingly specific ads as it monitors how a user clicks through a website. What we're talking about is relational databases. What we're talking about is finding patterns where nobody ever even thought of the possibility of looking at patterns before. That's what I mean about the evolution of human thought. We simply look at things differently now. This is a perfectly sensible, ordinary kind of statement to make in a popular magazine. 15 years ago, people would have wondered, what the heck is that? What do you mean cross-referencing? What do you mean knowing their magazines? So now let's go back to Mars. Okay. Starts out as the red one. It's a wanderer. So we don't know what's going on up there, but we do know that it's got regular movement and irregular movement. As long as we've got these things that can move around any old way they want, they sort of take on the characteristics of gods. That's one of the differences between us and the gods. Um, the key one, of course, being that we die. Uh, right? <laughs> um, that's why if you ask for synonyms for human, one of the first ones that always comes to mind is mortal. Um, and the synonym for the gods, of course, is immortal. So they can choose not to die. Of course, there's, when you're 12, you always wonder, could God kill himself? Okay? Um, that, that, that keeps you going through, you know, till 4 o'clock in the morning. Anyway. The Mesopotamians had a god of war named Nergal, and uh, that was Mars. And we have references to it. Those of you who know your Bible well can uh, find it in uh, Nahum 3.13, when it talks about the destruction of uh, the Nineveh Gate, uh, the Nergal Gate in Nineveh. And the destruction has to do with fire, flood, and the sea turn the, the river turning red. Mars is the color of blood. It's reasonable to understand, then, that it becomes a war god. The implements of war are iron, often, and iron rusts. 
another red color. So war works fine. But if war is looked at in a sense as sec a secondary activity, as it tended to be in the philosophy of the Greeks, we get an image of the war god, which is really relatively restrained. He's, he, well, he's like a Greek god. <laughs> you know, he's, he's composed, he's classic. I love the way he's got his foot up there, you know. I just, you know. He's cool. He's watching everything. He's not the highest god. See? He's not the highest god. But the Romans were a martial people from the word Mars. And indeed, they, although Mars is not the highest on their pantheon, in fact, the worship of Mars was probably the most vigorous in Rome. Uh, this particular statue um, is from the US Capitol. And you'll see from the note I have there that it was, in fact, carved by a, a long descendant of the Romans, uh, an immigrant from Italy to the United States. So Mars has a pretty important place for us, too. That's Mars as God. And you can keep Mars as God as long as you have many gods. But when you decide to have one god, either you decide your god is a war god or somehow those particular characteristics, a god of war, a god of love, a god of fertility, you know, those things have to coalesce and you lose those. And that's what I call the sunset of Mars that sometime when monotheism begins to get fully established, as it certainly does by, in the West by the second or third century of this era, uh, Mars, the planet, as Mars, the god, is less important. And I take it that that's still true. That is, my guess is that very few of you look up in the sky, see Mars, and think, that's a god. But once upon a time, people did. Our thoughts change. We look at things, and they seem to us to be different than they once were. That's a shagbar hickory, not just a tree. Over time, there have been, there's a, a story one could tell about the scientific observations of Mars. And as Mars, as the observation of Mars teaches us new things, we think differently about what Mars might be, and that helps us change our thinking about what the world is. Starting with the Babylonians and to Copernicus, we're going through the period when we begin to understand that we can talk about the regularity in the movement of the wanderer. So the name becomes anachronistic, in fact, oxymoronic. But we don't really, really understand it well until we get to Copernicus, and then things go on. But let's pick this up about with Copernicus. On the way to him, although Mars hides as a god, he persists in the sort of pseudo-scientific spiritual beliefs people have. The Mars symbol in astrology goes all the way back to Ptolemy, who gives us a way of looking at the planets. And you notice, of course, that the Mars symbol is, well, you can think of it as a soldier holding a sword. It's also the symbol for iron in alchemy. And so before we move to modern science, as we're moving through alchemy, we're getting exactly the same symbol. In fact, the Mars symbol is used for many things. And one that it's still used for in botany is the symbol for a plant with a two-year growing cycle. Because it turns out that the period of Mars is just about double the period of Earth. So a Martian year is about two Earth years. And as you can see here, we keep the word Mars in the names of the week and so on. Tuesday is from a Norse god, Tiyu, which who is the, uh, the Norse equivalent of a war god. The N Norse had several war gods, so you can pick the war god you like. Um, they were good at war. Um, so what's the problem? I mean, what, what's, why is Mars of particular interest, other than the fact that it's red, reminds us of rust, iron, war, masculinity, blood, passion, death, little things. Here's the problem. On the right, we are going to be seeing Earth, Sun, and Mars moving around with Earth at the center. On the left, you'll see the same thing with the Sun at the center. I'd like you to take a look at the difference in the paths that Mars traces.
Now that particular shape on the right, which is called a limaçon, for any of you who are big fans of analytic geometry, that shape is what you would see if, in fact, there were uniform motion of Mars around the Earth and the Sun also were going around the Earth. But the circle is what you would get if, in fact, things worked as we, as Copernicus said they worked. Actually, Copernicus, you guys probably know, is wrong. Um, an oval is a circle where the center has been split apart and moved. Right? So there are two foci in an oval. A, a circle is just a special case of an oval. Copernicus believed, of course, that the heavens, since they were so regular, had to be perfect. Since they were perfect, of course, the, the movements of the planets had to be circles, and therefore his calculations for how the planets would actually appear to move were off. But Kepler understood that the planets cut out equal areas in equal time, which is doable if you go from any given focus, even of an oval, and that correction made it possible for Galileo to say, by golly, it actually works, or nonetheless, it moves, as he's famously said to have said. So you see this limaçon. That limaçon, well, we can't see it, right? I mean, we don't look down on, uh, on uh, the solar system. So this is what you would see if you actually were looking at uh, the sky, and you were very good. This particular. Uh, tracing starts October 13th, 1996, and you can watch the dates go on by. This will show you how Mars appears to move against the fixed planets day by day. You see what's going on? That's what is actually visible to a careful observer from the Earth. You see Mars following along, I mean, because we're looking at things edgewise, that's why the circle looks like, and then it goes back west to east and then it turns around again. It takes about two years till it gets back to the beginning, because that's the cycle for Mars. That's what's called the retrograde motion of Mars. And it is a consequence of the fact that Mars's period is longer than ours. Of course, there's retrograde motion for every planet that's further out than we are. But it's not really easy to see for most of the other planets, because their periods are so much greater than the Earth's year. But Mars is just a simple multiple of Earth's year, and so the problem of the retrograde motion of Mars made it clear that you're not going to just be able to say that things are going around the Earth on circles. Okay? So Ptolemy comes up with a suggestion. He says, instead of thinking that Mars is riding around a circle that surrounds the Earth, let's have Mars sit on a circle and it rides around that circle while the circle rides around the circle that's around Earth. We'll see it doing is going like this and back and continuing again. It looks like a pretty good copy of retrograde motion. But Copernicus had a different explanation, and this is one you can see visualized quite nicely. So on the left, you'll see Earth, Mars. Obviously, Earth is going around the sun twice as fast as Mars is. On the right, you'll see Mars moving against the fixed stars. OK. That's the retro, okay, can you imagine this? It's just, it blows my mind growing up in Brooklyn, you know, that a gazillion years ago, there were shepherds lying out there all night and watching this, like, for a year. And they, you know, oh, yeah, goes backwards. How'd they get that? I mean, I'm lucky if I can find the moon. Anyway, <laughs> uh, so Copernicus came up with a good suggestion. It, it worked, certainly once we had Galileo's correction. The thing about that is, once you come up with that, the sun is no longer the center. The sun is, in fact, the prototype for the monotheistic god. Among the Egyptians, it's Ra. Um, if you look at old Hebrew iconography, you'll see pictures, for example, of Moses uh, with the sun disk rising behind him. This gives uh, rise, ultimately, both to the, no the uh, notion that Jews have horns and to the use of halos. No, seriously, that's what it is. It comes from those old pictures of the sun disk. Um, there are 
there are religions that worship uh, cattle and have the same sun disk showing and so on. The sun, you know, you can feel its power. The sun is the prototype for the one God, if you move toward one God. And now Copernicus had demonstrated that that's not where we should be moving. So there's a problem. And this mid 16th, 17th century etching of Copernicus, I think, is really quite clever. It shows him looking at, in a quite um, devout way, one would suppose, uh, the image of his God. But notice what's going on. At the base of the crucifix, there is a skull. That is a reminder of the medieval use of a memento mori, a reminder of death. Uh, the idea is that you fix on the possibility that you could die tomorrow and make sure that you live as if you were ready to meet your maker. That's another sort of change of how we think. But Copernicus is actually resting his elbow on it. He's not contemplating it at all, as opposed to Hamlet. Alas, poor Copernicus. So, and behind him, you notice he has a celestial sphere and calipers, which, you know, in real life, they don't stand up on their own. Um, so the artist is obviously making sure that we can see that those calipers are, in effect, the tools of Copernicus. It's the same visual image. It's a kind of, um, it's a kind of I think, subversive notion that Copernicus may appear to be uh, worshiping God, but in fact, what Copernicus is doing is all of the work necessary to get God off center. Now, we're out there in the world, as we are now on Earth, the Earth is now part of a system, the system has its own regularities, <clears throat> there are other planets, Mars is one of them. What kind of a world is that? Aristotle said that nature does not allow a vacuum. By the Middle Ages, people had noticed that you can go like this. You know, you can create a partial vacuum, right? And so the, in the Middle Ages, after Aristotle's work were rediscovered through a, a translation from Arabic, they modified that to say nature abhors a vacuum. Okay, so you can start to get a vacuum, but it ain't going to stay around very long. Okay. The philosopher is what Aristotle was known as, and he said that it was a, there could be no vacuum. Hence, the ancient Greek stories, for instance, of harnessing a flock of geese to fly up to the moon. Um, well, you knew you couldn't get geese to cooperate, but except for that, it was a plausible story. So you thought of yourself as only stopped from getting to the moon and Mars and the other planets by a technical difficulty. Can't jump that high, but otherwise, it's sort of part of our world. That's a long way from what we think of today. How did we get to what we think of today? Evangelista Battista Torricelli, in 1643, asked himself a question which has often bothered me, and I'm sure it's bothered many of you, and that is, when I'm digging a well, you all dig wells? <laughs> it's a great way to spend your weekends. Right, when you're digging a well, if you strike water, Anywhere down to about 33 feet, it comes bubbling right up, and you feel cool. If it's more than 33 feet down, the water doesn't come up. Why? Torricelli had this absolutely bizarre idea. He said, what if, what, I know this is crazy, folks. Well, he said that in Italian. Sono, sono pozze, pero, Right? What if <laughs> air had weight? Nah. Look, humor me. If air had weight and it was just like going down through the ground and pushing up the water, then the air, if it weighed enough to hold up a column of water about 33 feet high, that would explain it. So all he needed to do he figured this out, he was a physicist, was get a tube 33 feet long, seal one end, fill it with water, and put it up in a bathtub, and then take away his hand, and if the water splooshed right out, 
then the air had no weight. But if the air pushing down on the water in the bathtub held up the water, then clearly air had weight. We have very good people here with the demonstrations and everything. The odds of you making a tube 33 feet long, not so easy. Fair. Oh, you're worried about the ceiling. Fabrication's not a problem? Uh, you can do it, all right. <laughs> Ev couldn't. <laughs> so while he was having somebody else fabricate a tube about a meter and a half long, because he thought, I'll use the densest liquid I can find to shorten the tube, mercury. Um, he did some calculations. He knew how far away the moon was. Hell, Aristotle knew how far away the moon was. You can do that with trigonometry. 400,000 kilometers, which sounds more scientific than a quarter of a million miles. Um, same moon. Anyway, you know how far away the moon was. And he said, if the column of air holding up the water is distributed uniformly, then it can't be more than five miles high. He knew that, so clearly it wasn't going to work out. But he got the mercury. The guy, his lab assistant, fabricated the stuff. He turned it over. He pulled out his hand, and the mercury went broing. And when that happened, <clears throat> first of all, he had created the first permanent partial vacuum in the history of humanity. Second of all, he created the first barometer and we still call a unit of barometric pressure the tor after this fellow. But what's more important is that he realized that between his experiment and the moon, almost all of that 240,000 miles was empty. In 1643, Torricelli discovered outer space. And suddenly, Mars wasn't just really far away, but you could fly there with cooperative geese. Suddenly, Mars was across an immense killing vacuum. We suddenly were not just sitting here in the solar system that God had quite nicely made for us. We were on a rare speck of life-sustaining rock in a universe that was inimical to humanity. And Mars was part of that. In fact, it was the most inimical because it still had the associations with war. Christian Huygens, however, looked at Mars through an improved, fairly newly developed telescope and gives us the very first drawing that looks anything like a map. This is probably what we now call Certus Major in 1659. He wrote about Mars. He studied it as well as he could given the technology of the time, and he called it another Earth. He said these were our cousins. He could tell, in fact, that it had an atmosphere because he could watch stars be occluded as they went around its disk. Unfortunately, his observations were wrong, and he thought it had rather a thick atmosphere, and so he thought that there were going to be living creatures there. Now, either we had to decide that God had made creation more than once, or our God wasn't the only God. You feel different when you walk into church. You know, if it's not just your God who's out there. This was doing strange things to the way people thought. Giovanni Cassini, no relation as far as I can tell to Oleg Cassini, but you never know, um, studied Mars during the opposition of 1666. 1666, for you English majors out here, is known as Annus Mirabilis. It's the miraculous year when we have the plague, the fire of London, and a number of other things. One of them is this opposition during which Cassini not only was able to see that the rings of Saturn actually have an empty space in them, which is still known as the Cassini division, but he was able to see a spot on Mars and watch it change from day to day and calculated the period of Mars. Turns out that the Martian day, he got it to within about an hour of what we know it to be, and it is almost identical to Earth's day. And suddenly, the idea that we have cousins out there became important. But, you know, I don't know about your family, but in my family, every now and then, you know, like if we're rooting for different teams on Thanksgiving, um, there are fights. If it turns out your cousin is the god of war, you could kind of count on it. Having cousins, having family is not inherently a wonderful thing. Another wonderful thing that happened in that Annus Mirabilis is that Isaac Newton 
going away from university into the country because of the plague, did some thinking. And one of the things that he thought up and finally published in 1687 in Principia Mathematica is what we call the, uni the, law, the universal law of gravitation. Uh, I don't need to go over that here. I'm sure you are all aware. The fundamental thing that Newton was able to do was show that the rules that make apples fall, whether or not one hit him on his head, I don't know. but. I doubt it, you know, I think it's an apple because these, that's how we translate, that's how we think of the fruit of knowledge in the Bible. Um, and Newton spent a lot of his career writing religious sonnets in Latin. He didn't like realizing that he was sort of screwing up his own religion. Um, he saw that the same rules that make the apple fall here on earth explain Kepler's laws. And so, there was no difference between the earthly realm and the other realm, the sublunary and the superlunary, except that to move around in it, we had to go through that imposing vacuum. So here we are then, suddenly in a solar system, which seems to be huddled around that one little furnace offering life in this huge, immense universe, and we're very much alone. Giovanni Schiaparelli, who became the director of the observatory, the Brera Observatory in Milan, um, looked at the moon, at, the, at Mars during another opposition, and he described the canali that he saw there. Those of you who speak Italian will realize that canali has two English translations. One is channels, one is canals. English speakers decided it was canals. Where there are canals, there must be canal makers. Where there are channels, it only means that water ran. Schiaparelli was not trying to argue that there were Martians. However, Percival Lowell was sure there were Martians, and he was very rich, and so he took his money and went out to Flagstaff, Arizona, and built an observatory with the intention of getting good enough views of Mars to demonstrate that there were Martians. Obviously, he couldn't see the Martians, but he might be able to see other things. In fact, what he thought he saw were the canals. Well, you couldn't even see the canals. He understood that. But what you could see, of course, as you could see if you looked down at the Nile, was the swath of vegetation that would be along the sides of the canals. And so he looked up at Mars and saw a planet of red desert with those lines. Now, what you see here, the upper picture with the black background is one set of maps that he drew. And the one below is actually an appendix in his 19, 1895 book, Mars, the Abode of Law, just called Mars, I'm sorry. He published about four books on Mars arguing that it had life. And in this first one, the little numbers and things you might see, there's little guide numbers here, are all to the names he gave to the features of Mars. He pulled those names from the first map that was made of the Mediterranean world. And that first map, therefore, has the names of real places um, and also the names of gods. So Mount Olympus is there. Olympus Mons, which we now know is the tallest volcano in the universe, sorry, solar system, or at least that's what we think at the moment. Lowell didn't, of course, prove there were Martians. He was arguing for Martians strenuously, but what he did do was make it scientific to think of Mars in mythological terms. So Mars has been regained in myth, but no longer myth taken as religion, myth taken as aspiration. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a world where we still had the great gods? Science fiction thought so and began to make maps of Mars that echoed Lowell's. H.G. Wells um, understood what it meant to have cousins on Mars in The Star, which is one of the great, one of, actually one of the great stories in English. A flaming object comes through the solar system. That's the star. It turns out not to be a star at all. It's some kind of a body, however, and it passes close to Earth and wreaks havoc, tidal waves, all kinds of things, but then carries on around and goes past the sun. In the, penult in the last paragraph of the story, suddenly the narrator, who's been telling all of this in third person, shifts viewpoint. We think, we had thought this guy was like an Earthman or an historian after the fact, but suddenly we realize he has a more godlike viewpoint. 
The Martian astronomers, for there are astronomers on Mars, although they are very different beings from men, were naturally profoundly interested in the, by these things. They saw them from their own standpoint, of course. Considering the mass and temperature of the missile that was flung through our re solar system into the sun, one wrote, it is astonishing what a little damage the Earth, which it missed so narrowly, has sustained. All the familiar continental markings and the masses of the seas remain intact, and indeed, the only difference seems to be a shrinkage of the white discoloration, supposed to be frozen water, round either pole. Which, the narrator concludes the story, only shows how small the vastest of human catastrophes may seem at a distance of a few million miles. So Mars becomes, once we have some way of gauging it scientifically, a platform from which we can think about what we're doing. The War of the Worlds is perhaps Wells's most famous discussion of this, and he sees Mars as our enemies. Well, 1898, it's the Boer War, 1898, Crimea, 1898, we're all on the verge of watching colonialism finally collapse. In America, Edgar Rice Burroughs begins his Mars series, and as you can tell from our hero fighting the big green Martian on the Red Desert, what he's done is made Arizona over. <laughs> and a lot of science fiction is just that. It's, it's Westerns cast in space. Now the key pattern for a Western is that you have an in-group, which usually has schools and jails and laws and women, and an out-group, which usually has high survival skills, although they won't survive long because they don't have women. Right? So you've got the town, and you've got the outlaws, or you've got the, sh the sheep herders, and you've got the ranchers, or you've got the wagon train and the marauding Indians. Okay? So the in-group and the out-group. And the story is, set in this vast landscape, a lone hero comes along who, for some reason, shares the values of the in-group, but the survival skills of the out-group. And then he mediates the relations between them putting the outgroup to rest, and then he becomes, of course, the most dangerous guy in town. So either he has to ride off into the sunset, like Shane or the Lone Ranger, or like Owen Wister's Virginian, he has to hang up his guns. So that's the American Western. And that's like 50% of all the science fiction stories between 1912 and 1960. Right? They were Westerns set in space. This character, by the way, holding the sword, is John Carter, late captain of the Confederate States of America. He could not bring chivalry to success on Earth, but on Mars, where he, of course, is three times stronger because he grew up in a place with a heavier gravity, on Mars, he can, in fact, make the green men and the red men finally come to terms. In the last book in the series, he goes back and lives with his Martian princess and their child. How exactly the, anyway. <laughs> Orson Welles picks up H.G. Wells' story, Howard Koch writes the script, and we get one of the most famous radio broadcasts ever. And this is how it begins. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied, perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacence, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense ethereal gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours that are the beasts in the jungle, intellects vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. Minds that are to our minds as ours are to the beasts in the jungle. This reminds us of the line from, well, at least it reminds English majors, um, <laughs> the line from King Lear, as flies to wanton boys are we to the gods, they kill us for their sport. 
suddenly the Martians, because of this enormous contrast of scales, take on the same uh, role in relation to us as we do to the animals. We could be wiped out by them. And this is the beginning of this story. Now, the, the one thing to notice is the idea that we are subject to powers beyond us, it doesn't require Mars. But how we imagine those powers to be, that changes when we think of Mars as being in our neighborhood and when we think that our cousins are up there. Second thing, when you hear this opening, it's kind of impossible to believe that people actually thought that Martians had landed in Grover Mill, New Jersey. What happened was Fred Allen's comedy hour was very, very popular, and Mercury Theater on the Air was kind of new. So people listened to Fred Allen until he got to the place where in the program the singer came on. And if it wasn't a popular singer, they flipped the dial. And when they flipped the dial, they came to this. Pardon in front of the pit. About 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back now. They're willing to keep their distance. The captain is conferring with someone. Can't quite see who. Oh, yes, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Yes, it is. Now, now they've parted, and the professor moves around one side, studying the object while the captain and two policemen advance with something in their hands. I can see it now. It's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. Those creatures know what that means. What anything means. Wait a minute, something's happening. A shape is rising out of the pit. And they make out a small beam of light against the mirror. It's that. There's a jet of flame springs from the mirror that leaps right at the advancing men. It strikes them head on. The orders are turning into flames. And they're sealed caught by the woods of the fires. They're gas tanks, tanks for the automobiles, spreading everywhere. Coming this way now, about 20 yards to my right. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. <laughs> Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. So this was the night before Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> and it was less than a year before Hitler was going to march into Poland. Everybody was on edge. Everybody thought invasion was possible. People tuned in, and when that silence happened, confirming that some incredible weapon had occurred, people actually panicked. I've got, I can't tell you the things they said, but it's, I've got a whole list of them. The guy named Hadley Cantrill um, in Princeton um, interviewed them, and they said wonderful things like, well, I'd been saving that scotch for a special occasion. I decided to have it then. Anyway, <laughs> my favorite is the woman who says, if it turns out to be true, at least I won't have to take that guff from my mother-in-law anymore. Uh, <clears throat> it really does focus the mind enormously to contemplate the gallows, and that's what was going on here. Mars changed our way of thinking. After the bomb, when America suddenly felt in some sense secure, Ray Bradbury comes out with the Martian Chronicles, the last chapter of which, called The Million Year Picnic, gives us a pastoral Mars that looks like paradise again. And this is that Mars. This is a family who is going to give themselves up to that landscape and become renewed. It is a second shot at the promise of a redemptive America. However, the bomb that makes that possible destroys Earth, so those Earth men who go to Mars have the privacy to actually be better. And we also see in the 1950s the idea that the Martians stand for our cousins, um, those who would attack us whom we cannot see. They are the red menace. We are worried about communism. George Powell's 1953 version of The War of the Worlds won an Academy Award for Special Effects. Notice the flying saucers, right? The flying saucers. Carl Jung wrote a very interesting book called Flying Saucers, The Psychology of a Mass Psychosis, in which he argued the necessity of the flying saucer craze in the 1950s because we felt unmoored. Without an ability to have a god who would bring justice into the world, we needed something, even if that was going to be a bad thing. And it's not all bad things. As in the day the Earth stood still, they come down in the flying saucer and they say, now, be good. This is what you have to do. Stop fighting. Those are, of course, mothers. Um, <laughs> which is why the Martians arrive in saucers. 
<laughs> as opposed to rocket ships. This is fully consistent across the history of science fiction. If you want to see something different, you need to find a, a vehicle that's built in space to stay in space, like the Starship Enterprise, which will have both pointy parts and round parts. <laughs> So, so Mommy Martian got to feel kind of good, and we wanted to feel better about this, and then we wound up with my favorite Martian on TV, and we kept our little pet Martian at home. He's like the great-great-grandfather of E.T. Uh, we were able to start using this stuff satirically, so here come those flying saucers again. Well, you know, you can make fun of these things, right? That's what happens when you tame Mars. Um, we, in fact, make it all funny. Ha, we are masters of everything. Um, Phobos and Deimos, fear and terror, as Asaph Hall called the moons of Mars when he discovered them in 1877, are pebbles to us. Right? They turn into nothing when NASA is able to send up great telescopes. So I call this the NASAfication of Mars. Mars just becomes another thing in our neighborhood. We've got to go to work on it. But then something happens, the Challenger. I imagine any of us here over a certain age remember seeing it that day, if not as it happened, and everyone has seen it. At the end of that minute, seven people fall to Earth, along with the idea that we can leave the planet. And then we begin climbing back. We decide we're going to just use this concept, <laughs> and in fact, we're going to... <laughs> reuse this concept. <laughs> and when we finally get back to Mars, we will announce it with this wonderful first composite picture. NASA sends us on Independence Day. What a coincidence. And it's Arizona, <laughs> right? In fact, if you read the press release that comes with it, it turns out that they, looking out across the desert, named these things the Twin Peaks. <laughs> cool, huh? They're about 30 meters high, <laughs> right? They're about three times the size. They're, well, about two and a half times the, the height of this room. Those are the Martian mountains, but it's, we've got it. We're, we finally got where John Carter wanted to get. We are going to conquer Mars. There's the Mars rover, which Time Magazine called one of the best devices of 2002. Red rover, red rover. Isn't it it's faithful? Here, rover. It's a red rover. It's going to Mars. In fact, although here it seems to be dominating the Martian landscape, it's actually, you've got to crouch down to make it taller than you are. It's actually like a German shepherd, but a mechanical German shepherd. But NASA wants us to see it as us conquering. In fact, this is NASA artwork. Um, it tells us that the moon is about the size, has the surface area of about Africa, and Mars has a surface area about that of the Earth. Mars becomes an eighth planet to NASA. So we can terraform it. We can make it over. In fact, Time Magazine shows us this picture and calls it a Marscape. But in fact, it's Marscape, McMurdo Dry Valleys. It's Antarctica. And it's wonderful in the article, they've turned it around. Instead of saying Mars looks like Antarctica, they say Antarctica looks like Mars. As if we are more comfortable and at home on Mars than we are in Antarctica. This is becoming part of the Earth. We get excited when we discover water there. Those are the Canali. And so we have this wonderful story. June 9, 2003. First of all, notice the rocket. There are these little bitty people down here. And one honkin' rocket. <laughs> A forecast of high winds and severe storms forced NASA to delay today's launching of the first two probes, desi probes designed <laughs> to land and look for water on Mars. That's, we gotta get water, we gotta get life, we need cousins. Weather permitting, the space agency plans to try again on Monday, the two probes, et cetera, et cetera. The probe was to be launched today. Spirit, an identical probe to be launched this month, Opportunity weighed about 400 pounds each and carry scientific instruments to study the composition of the Martian soil and rocks. The tools include milling cutters to drill the outer layers of rocks and boulders and microscopes to inspect their interior. Now, here comes the cool part. 
The postponement of the launching came two and a half hours after NASA officially announced the name of the spacecraft. A nine-year-old girl from Scottsdale, Arizona, <laughs> who was born in Siberia. Okay, so it's the American promise of warmth and life against this poor little girl from this cold, foreign, red country, <laughs> right? And adopted as a toddler, okay, you can become an American, you can become a Martian. Right? submitted the winning names for both rovers. I used to live in an orphanage. It was dark and cold and lonely. I shouldn't make fun of her. I'm sure it was terrible, said Sophie Collis, reading her essay at a news conference. At night, I looked up at the sparkly sky. I felt better. I dreamed I could fly there. In America, I can make all my dreams come true. Thank you for the spirit and the opportunity. <laughs> Sophie's choice. Whoa. <laughs> For the probe's names was picked from almost 10,000 entries submitted by United States school children. The contest was sponsored by the Lego company. <laughs> ain't Mars fun, ain't Mars American. That's what we think of it as. We think of it as a place we've got to get to first. In fact, just, just now, in this January, some guy came up with an idea for a hyperdrive. And if you read the original article in which he announces it in The New Scientist, it talks all about the physics of it. And then later, there's this paragraph. But in The New Scotsman, and The Scotsman, when they um, decide to talk about it, they give it a different title. Welcome to Mars Express, only a three-hour trip. And at the very second pa paragraph, after they explain that there will be this hyperdrive, it says, the hypothetical device, which has been outlined in principle but is based on a controversial theory about the fabric of the universe. <laughs> could potentially allow a spacecraft to travel to Mars in three hours. Why Mars? Why not Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, right? It's got to be Mars. That's where we have to go. That's the neighborhood, right? And a journey to a star 11 light years away in just 80 days, according to a report in today's New Scientist magazine. Why a star 11 light years away? Why not 4.2 to Proxima Centauri, the closest star? Why not some other star? Because they worked backwards from the calculation. They wanted 80 days. They want Jules Verne. You can go around the world in 80 days. You can get to a goddamn star in 80 days. We want to make science fiction science fact. And Mars is our stepping stone. In in fact, just this month, the Martian Reconnaissance Orbiter was sent up, and the scientists say we are going to have a scientific foothold on Mars similar to that on Antarctica. It's a continent. It's ours. We're going to divvy it up. Burn, baby, burn, <laughs> they say of the rocket. But that's what you say when you're having purifying destruction, which is what we're going to do with Mars, because after all, we are capitalists. How's the launch going? It's right on the money. <laughs> what will we think of next? Thank you. <laughs> Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Physics Department of the University of Michigan, by the Dr. M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, and by gifts from friends of the program.